this summer. It's the U.S. versus the world. Unbelievable! Given away towards Sullivan. Comes back towards Alex Morgan! American women have set the standard in global soccer for more than two decades. Winning four of the past eight World Cups and elevating names like Lloyd, Rapino, and Morgan way beyond the sports world. We see the direct effect of winning a World Cup. Just the reception we got in the U.S. was incredible. And seeing the surgeons each four years is a special moment, and NWSL needs to be focusing on how to maximize that. The NWSL, or National Women's Soccer League, is the pro venture looking to take that global dominance and create a sustainable business for women's soccer. A task easier said than done. The NWSL is the third attempt at a professional league. And while it has lasted longer than its predecessors, just two years ago, its very existence was being questioned. Abuse and misconduct. Verbally and sexually. Our institution failed us. They didn't care. Now, with a new commissioner and deep-pocketed investors, the league is looking to level up and invest more money in building the future of the sport. The valuation of these teams have already gone from two to four million in two, three years to 50 million. Okay, something's going right in women's soccer and people want to be a part of it. This latest chance for women's soccer in the U.S. feels different, more urgent, better supported, and perhaps ultimately profitable, fulfilling a potential dating back to last century. I can remember exactly where I was in 99 when the women won the World Cup. And I remember thinking, this is it. This is the moment when everything's going to change. And it, it didn't. It, it completely didn't. So 1999 World Cup, I mean, obviously kind of the formative event of women's soccer in this country. You'll see some extraordinary things today, and you will meet this U.S. team that hopes to bring back the World Cup trophy. In the wake of that, you have players saying, okay, we've got we've to come together and form a league. They find money via TV, basically. They start with $40 million, and within three years, the league has shuttered. Professional U.S. women's soccer has a checkered history. Two attempts at a league each folded after just three years. For weeks, we've heard about a new professional women's league to start up in the spring, and now it finally has a name and a logo. It'll be the National Women's Soccer League, the NWSL. Comprised so when the NWSL took a third swing at establishing a league, they had to make sure they didn't strike out. By the time NWSL comes around, 2012, 2013, they've seen the first league fail and blow through a lot of money. The second league have all of these stabilization issues. And so some of the key takeaways for the NWSL are, we need stability and we need to be smart financially. I'm here at the grounds of the San Diego Wave. They're up against the Portland Thorns and the crowd is getting into the spirit. What's the vibe here at Snapdragon when, when it's game oh, day? Oh, it's just, it's, it's epic. I love our team. I love the whole vibe of the soccer scene in San Diego is just blowing up. Uh, we try to make it as loud as possible. It's a really fun and interesting thing because I think for a lot of people, this is the first time they've been to soccer matches that are this loud in the U.S. The Wave are a new team. They only began playing in 2022, but they've come charging out of the gates. The end-to-end -end entertainment here is something that I've never experienced as a player or as a head coach. It is the most exciting league in the world. 
this club wanted to be different. They wanted to hold themselves and the league to a higher standard. They wanted to provide a resource for the players that the players deserve. I've always been part of clubs as a player and as a coach that's had a men's team. So a lot of the time you play second fiddle, you're never the priority. Coming here, the women's team was going to be the priority. And going all in on a women's team looks to be paying off. This year, the Wave broke attendance records for the league, with their season opening game played in front of nearly 31,000 people. And it helps to be led by one of the most recognizable players in the game, Alex Morgan. You've played in sold out crowds, obviously, for the U.S. women's national team, but did you ever think you'd be playing in front of 30,000 people for your club team? It's just kind of the right moment, the right time, um, the right team, the right people to lead this organization and at a time where women's soccer is just growing exponentially. Morgan captains the wave. Players like her are a big draw for fans who have watched the U.S. national team. The fans see the good products we're putting on the field. And in San Diego, they've just rallied behind us so quickly, which has been great. Growth is being seen across the NWSL. More than 90,000 people came to watch a game during the first part of the 2023 season, about 50% higher than previous years. But before we get swept away in the excitement, it's important to remember how close the whole league was to folding again. Rewind a couple of years, and things are looking very uncertain. The National Women's Soccer League faces a reckoning over charges that it ignored abuse of its players. In 2021, The Athletic published an investigation into North Carolina Courage head coach Paul Riley, alleging he had sexually coerced and verbally abused his players. After those allegations were made public, more came to light. A damning report concluded emotional abuse and sexual misconduct has been systemic in the top tier of women's football in the United States. After further reporting and an internal investigation, five out of the 10 teams then in the league had head coaches resign or be fired. It was also alleged the NWSL's commissioner was repeatedly told about Riley's alleged behavior and didn't take action. Paul Riley and Lisa Barrett have both denied the allegations of wrongdoing. All of this history, right, of players thinking, if I say something about conditions or the way I'm being treated, I might get cut, my team might fold, the league might fold. We turn now to Sinead Fairley and Mana Shim. With them for support is Alex Morgan. Mana, how do you feel? I want more. I want more justice. I want better policies. I want players to be protected. Players stepped up in that moment and led that narrative. You had Megan Rapino saying, burn it all down. Like, not afraid to threaten the league's existence. Meg Linehan broke the story for The Athletic and reported as the league teetered on the brink of collapse. What she saw was an organization which prioritized protecting itself and was unwilling to be self-critical. I think every single player in the NWSL has always had to think about their team, the league, the game itself, right? That pressure created a silence that then allowed this misconduct to just completely go unchecked because there was true fear about your job security, your teammates. We had to go through some dark moments and that's because the league didn't protect the players. The league forced the players into thinking that we're grateful for the opportunity to play. We're grateful for the opportunity to be a professional soccer player in the U.S. And so we didn't speak up for the vulnerable positions that we were put in. With the league's reputation damage, a new commissioner was needed and whoever was going to sign up had a long to-do list. Two years removed from a scandal that threatened its very existence, the NWSL is now expanding. Under the league's new commissioner, Jessica Berman, the NWSL has steadied the ship and charted a path to growth. Hello, welcome. World headquarters, great yeah, to see you. It's our new home. Welcome to our, our humble it. abode. How many full-time employees are there now? When I started exactly a year ago, we had 20, and now we just hired our 60th person. So wow. we've tripled in size in 12 months. It's pretty incredible. When you think about running an entire sports league, True. I feel like people would be shocked to find out that it was only 60 people. I came from the NHL where we had over a thousand 
people. And so the idea of running a 14 team league with just 60 people is pretty lean. What is the right way to sort of measure growth and measure success? I mean, valuation is obviously a, a relatively easy one. Is it revenue? Is it attendance? It always comes back to attendance. And so that to me is the most important mm. indicator of success and health of our league. And so we're super focused on that and very proud of how our attendance is growing. And year over year, we're up 48% in attendance just three weeks into our season. Despite limited resources, the NWSL is seeing growth across the board. Sponsorship revenue has grown 87% year on year. And the expansion fee, which is the amount new owners pay the league to create another team, has rocketed more than 20-fold. So this expansion process, talk to us about that because it's a big decision to take on. I feel like every league of, of any stature that we talk to, expansion is always the big question. How did you work out how and when to do it? There were definitely a lot of groups who were thinking that the franchise was going to sell for very low figures, and it wasn't until we reset the stage and hired a proper investment bank and invested in ourselves and forced everybody into a professional process that we learned that there was incredible demand, low supply, and economics will tell you that in that kind of environment, particularly with a high growth asset, that you can achieve outsized investment. And that's what we got with the $53 million price tag with selling Team 14. Team 14 is now called Bay FC, based out of San Francisco, and is founded by four legends of the game. Brandy Chastain, Leslie Osborne, Daniel Slayton, and Allie Wagner. My biggest goal for this team, this club, is, is really to change the trajectory of women's sports. This is about the possibility of, of leaning into the space, leaning into our market, leaning into women's soccer, women's sports, and, and proving that it's, it's a very good investment. In an effort to draw more money into the league and secure its long-term future, the NWSL through Bay FC opened the door to new money, institutional investors. It's a bold move in the US where sports ownership has long been dominated by wealthy individuals and families. When you take the stakes in the teams, you get into a world that, candidly, institutional capital has not been in. Correct. What did you discover using the lens through which you see about the businesses themselves? So I had my team that was doing work all around the world, across all different sports leagues, start doing work. And the punchline is, the more we dug in, we just kept saying, like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. And then we said, hey, this is, a, this is actually big enough to be a Sixth six Street opportunity. Alan Waxman is the chief executive of Sixth Street, Bay FC's new majority owner. He'll serve as the team's co-chair along with Ali Wagner. The global investment firm has deep pockets with some $60 billion in assets. It became the first institutional fund to become a majority owner of a professional U.S. sports franchise after committing $125 million to buy and fund the new NWSL team. This is the most populous girls' sport in, in the United States growing up. Just to give you a stat, 20 years ago, 25% of the youth soccer leagues were girls. Today, it's 50%. So there's so sort of emerging tin of more prospective fans coming in. That's number one. Number two is the best product in the world is played in the United States for women's soccer. Waxman argues he's buying in at the beginning of a wave, and the league's growth means his investment will pay off, big time. If you talk to any investor and you say, let me tell you about an investment, okay? You can create it at a 66% discount to all the major comps out there. And by the way, what you're creating is growing three to five times faster than the other comps out there. And I'd say that to any professional investor in the world, I'd say that doesn't exist. But it does exist, and it exists in the NWSL franchise, and that's what we see. I mean, we're literally creating these things at 66% discounts and they're growing three to five times greater. And that's why we sort of said, we're going all in on this. We think it's one of the most asymmetric investment opportunities we've seen. When you see people like Sixth Street private equity coming in, 
How much do you think that that changes things, that people are coming in with the vision that this is for business and that this is a league that can actually make a lot of money? When you change someone's mindset, either in private equity or, or whatever it is, and they want to invest, that means it's gonna be a good investment. Like they've done their due diligence and they see that this is the next big thing that has taken off, that you're gonna see a return. I mean, the valuation of these teams have already gone from two to four million in two, three years to 50 million. Like, okay, something's going right in women's soccer and people wanna be a part of it. Although the new money is welcome, there are concerns. Will private equity partners stay around if the going gets tough? Women's soccer has been burnt before. I've got to ask the elephant in the room question, which is people are scared of private equity. Yep. It, you know, people look at the business model and at least on the face of it, you're going to invest, then you're going to hold it for a few years, then you're going to get out. We can sit down and we can provide much more, I'd say, flexible capital solutions. So it's a, that, I'd say that's the first thing. The second thing is, Look, the fact of the matter is our capital, the way it's set up, most of our funds is very long dated capital. So the thing they're most worried about is they're looking for real partners that are gonna be around for a period of time. I think before there was a lot of people that, that wanted to support women's soccer because it felt like it was the right thing to do. And they loved the game, they loved watching it, but it wasn't that they thought it was gonna be a viable business opportunity. And now you've seen really smart people start to, to take a look at the data, look at the numbers, and understand that if we start to leverage these assets, if we actually lean into the space, we will change uh, the model. We will change what is possible in women's sports. While money from Wall Street is helping create a new team on the West Coast, in the middle of the US, investment is transforming another team. The Kansas City-based NWSL team has had quite the turnaround story. In 2021, they finished last in the league and didn't even have a permanent name or branding. But a year later, wife and husband Angie and Chris Long bought into the club and turned things around. They have a name, the Kansas City Current, with new branding. But the two are also looking at a long-term investment strategy, quite literally building the foundation of their new asset. They invested $18 million in a new training center for the team and are currently working to build more pitches and an academy complex right next door. But the club's making history in a different way. They're spending $120 million to build what is remarkably the world's first dedicated women's professional sports stadium. Hi guys. Hi. Look at this place. It's so good to see you guys here. This is your home. What does it feel like to see it? This is epic. I mean, there's been so much progress and I just keep thinking to myself, like, I just can't wait for this city to experience this incredible stadium. The stadium is dug down eight rows. There's the suites are on the concourse level. There's three rows there and then the five rows in front are basically on the pitch. The Long's background is in business and investing, not soccer. They both started out working for J.P. Morgan Chase, and the pair now run Palmer Square Capital Management, whose assets exceed $22 billion. You didn't think you'd be getting a workout on this, did yeah, you? Yeah, seriously. Wow, this is incredible. Oh my. For Kansas City owners, this stadium is more than just a building. Look at how close you are to the field, even from way up here. Yeah, even from all the way up here. What a great view. It represents the city's commitment to supporting its women's soccer team. It's important to us to, to make that investment so they can play at their best. When I mean, you think about the history of professional women's soccer, uh, a lot of times that investment was not, was not made. And, that, and if the players can't play it, at their best, then the product isn't as good. And then from a fan perspective, the entertainment value isn't as high. And so to us, it isn't actually about choosing to invest in the players instead of investing in the business side or the front office side. I think this community has clearly rallied around this team and this organization. Ticket sales have been north of 10,000 for, for every game. We're gonna be sold out every single game in our new stadium. But the reason they come and the reason they watch is because the players are so good, the team is so good, um, the product is really, really good.
And for those teams putting money in, there is hope of some sizable growth for the league coming soon. The NWSL is betting that streaming, alongside linear TV coverage, will get more eyeballs on the game. The truth is, what changes everything, it's the media dollars. It's hard to get excited about a game that you can't see. It's hard to get excited about players you can't know. It's hard to get excited to go to a game that's not in an environment um, like we would think of as a true professional sports environment. In March, the NWSL announced CBS would hold the broadcast rights for the U.S. Back in 2020, CBS paid $4.5 million over three years for the rights. The cost of the current deal hasn't been made public, though it's assumed to be significantly higher. That increase will directly impact the valuation of current and future franchises. If they secure the bag, this could like truly change the way that the NWSL looks in the short term. They've never had access to that level of money. Even if they hit 10 million a year, that's already like so far and above where they've been in the past. I think that there is this kind of existential question and this balance that the NWSL has to work, which is, can we find a deal with one partner, maybe multiple partners, where we're able to grow an audience over network television? Right at the moment, the NWSL really doesn't make any money from its media rights deals because they pay for their own production of games. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is, are you just gonna play the long game or not? Are you gonna try to make money right now? Or are you thinking about, well, if we can grow and get 1 million, 2 million, 3 million viewers a game, where does that put us in three, four, five years? The future of the NWSL seems optimistic, but we've been here before. The league has a history of being touted as the next great US women's sport before fading away. What makes this time different? Players finally feel safe, they feel protected, they feel like if there is a situation that they don't feel comfortable in, they can report that. There's reporting mechanisms now that there never existed. And since we fought for that, it's the league has been in a, a way better place than it ever was those first nine years. In the past, when people have created leagues for women teams, I think a lot of them have done it with great intentions. And it's thought of more as the, the charity arm of, of somebody's sponsorship group, as opposed to the revenue arm, uh, the investment arm. And I think one thing that's really changed is the new investors coming into this league are looking at it from an investment perspective, saying there's a huge opportunity here. And I think when you're willing to invest for the opportunity, you worry a little bit less about, oh, what if I lose a little bit of money in year one or year two? And you think about everything that I'm foundationally building. Team owners and the NWSL all argue the key to the success and sustainability of the league is a higher level of professional management, treating women's soccer as a valuable growing asset with its talent at the fore. I mean, these players are incredible. They're entertaining, they're strong, they're intelligent. These players didn't necessarily have the backing to go and maximize their potential just because the resources weren't there. If we do that right, that means we're succeeding on the business side. That means we're winning championships. And perhaps more importantly, we're developing the talent that go out into the world that start to shape things for the next generation. And that's how you change the world. It's not just with championships. It's with developing talent that can go out and make their mark on the world once they're long done in their playing career.